Hey y'all, Kelsey Kreveling with the Consultants Council here. I am so excited to be filming today with a special guest who I think you're going to really enjoy. He is now a Park City local uh, and is training for the 2026 Olympics. But not only that, he's also a entrepreneur and founder uh, who had a really successful exit and he is now an angel investor. So I think you're going to really love hearing his perspective, both on life, on training, on how to develop side businesses while you are focusing on your primary career, and how as consultants, you can interact and do a great job consulting for really large scale ventures, uh, which he's happened to lead. So with that, I welcome you to today's podcast uh, with guest Max Valverde. Welcome, glad to have you on the podcast. Uh, so Max is actually not our typical guest. He doesn't have a background specifically in consulting, but he does have an incredible business track record that I think you all are gonna find awesome and inspiring. But not only that, he's made a pretty interesting uh, pivot in his career and is taking on a very unique and different endeavor, uh, one that Park City really promotes. So Max, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, so tell us, what is it that you are aspiring to right now? Well, so right now, well, long story short, I'll compress the first half and then we can dive into it if you want. Sold a software company um, and then long story short, my family and I moved to Park City, Utah for general mountain biking and mountain fun, backcountry skiing in the, in the mountains. And then while here in Park City, I learned that backcountry skiing, which for people who don't know, it's where you basically hike up the mountain um, and then ski down. Just making that, it a lot harder. Yeah. Skiing down is not enough. That's yeah. what I do. Yeah, exactly. But you know, if you're into mountain biking, where that's somewhat similar, where you kind of earn your turns, you may go through a little pain to get up the mountain and you have a fun little descent. So yeah, so someone's like, yeah, it's gonna be in the Olympics in 2026. And you know, my you know, psycho ape brain was like, you know, well, I'd be 41. Um, it's, you know, there's gotta be, you know, a good 200 people doing this in the country. What if I just trained full time to do this? I mean, I have a unique situation in selling the company that we can take a handful of years off from work. So I was like, yeah, what if this would be fun? Um, and also kind of still show my kids what working hard looks like. So for the past year and change, I've been training full time as if I was a pro athlete, kind of went from a slightly overweight dad to now I just competed at the national championships and got 12th in the country. So, you know, nothing to sneeze at. And I'm one year into the three year, there's three years left till the Olympics. So it's a long shot. I mean, there's a lot of guys uh, currently doing it that are, you know, have been in the cross country running or track world for a long time. And are, you know, they're, I look up to these guys um, but I'm getting into their universe a little bit and it's it's super fun. So my, my handle is called Dad Bod Goes Pro. So kind of like overweight guy becomes a pro athlete. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's what I'm doing right now. That's awesome. What do you find is the general age range that you're gonna be competing against? Yeah, so there it's anywhere from 18 to, you know, 20, 29, 30. Okay. Um, they're usually young. I'd say the average age is like 24. 25, maybe, you know, 29. So yeah, they're definitely younger, but uh, you know, there's some stats out there that say like, you know, you lose 1% of your muscle mass, uh, like after 35 or something like that. Um, and so like, you know, I'm not really an elite athlete. It's not like I'm already reaching those sorts of, sure. you know, that level of, of optimization. So you know, if I can get to 98% of what my 18 year old self can do, then maybe that can Pretty still be awesome. national, com national right. competitive. Yeah. Well, and when you look at people who compete in endurance athletics, ultra marathons, things of that nature, they actually get better in a later time frame yeah. because it becomes so much of a mental game. Yeah. Uh, I'm super curious. And what does this event entail? What will you have to do in the Olympics? Yeah, so there's a, it's called the Schemo Sprint, so ski mountaineering, and it's the sprint race. So a lot of ski mountaineering, like the, the traditional, in the traditional sense, is like, you know, summiting three peaks, it takes like four hours, and that's the traditional. Um, there's something else called the sprint, which is literally only three and a half minutes. You run up something that's basically the, the height of the, 
the uh, the Statue of Liber Statue of Liberty. Okay. You basically sprint up that with three transitions along the way. So you run a third of the way up, take your skis off, put them on your backpack, run in your boots and poles up a steep thing, then put the skis back on your feet, skin some more, get to the top, then you do a double rip transition where you rip both. There's these things on the bottoms of the skis called skins that are kind of like felt material that allow you to walk uphill. Rip those off with like a double rip with, while you're jumping. It, so it that's something cool. you have to practice. Oh yeah, I practice that in the summer, and I can get that. I can get from skinning to skiing in like seven and a half seconds, which normally when you're in the backcountry that takes like ten minutes. Oh my god! Yeah, because you got to like do all these things with your skis. So these are like special boots, special skis. So it's like okay. one click, one click, double rip, boom, and then you're skiing. So it's. I think it's going to be a really fun sport to watch. Um, and the reason I'm also kind of growing a social media following for, around it is I thought, man, if I put in all this time and energy and make it to the Olympics, let's say, and like get a bronze medal or something, it's a provisional sport right now uh, in 2026 in Milan Cortina. Okay. So it might not become a, a you know, ongoing right. thing. Right. Like they try these things out. The host country can pick something. So because Italy is really good in schemo in the national world cup or in the global world cup circuit, they brought it in. Mm -hmm. And then what if it ne never goes anywhere and then this awesome sport just dies on the vine? And especially if, let's say, Salt Lake City gets the Olympics in 2030. Yeah, you kind of like to see the speed and the, there. And it's so cool. It's such a fun sport to watch. And so, yeah, my TikTok and Instagram is up to like something like combined like 70,000 or, or something followers. and Which is incredible because that's yeah. tough to gain. Yeah, and it's had like millions of of views about this stuff and all these people are like oh my this is such a sick sport like i think th this is going to be something the sport yep. so whether it's me or somebody else i'd love to bring some awareness to the sport as well yeah so that you know a lot of people can can take part in the fun yeah certainly yeah. so then where here in park city do you find it best for training and getting to kind of do get reps in well that's the thing is park city mountain has you're allowed to skin up in the morning or at night when the during the season, um, but you gotta wake up at five or six. And that's what I do that sometimes to, to get on the groomer. Mm -hmm. But during the day, there's no options in town that are on a groomer. So I'm like Avalanche One certified. I'll okay. go into the back country. So I'll go up, you know, behind Deer Valley, over off into the back country there. Um, there's, you just go into the woods, and, okay. but you just, but then, your survival is on you. Yeah. You gotta, then it, then but, you're not just training, you're also having to be a lot more. Yeah, but you learn your roots that like, okay, this is safe, mm -hmm. this is low angle, this is yep. not gonna be an avalanche. You learn how to read the avalanche forecasts. Even this season with yeah. so much snow. Yeah, no, it was so, so a couple days, it's a little hairy on the top of a ridge line. You get 50 mile an hour winds and you know, it gets kind of scary up there. But um, yeah, there's a lot of good places in town. But this is another thing I'd love to work with Park City Mountain or Deer Valley to get more uphill access for for uphill Training, skiing. Right. Yeah, just right. everyone. Anyone who I ever take up is like, this is effing amazing. Yeah. Like we a couple Dutch friends come in town from when we used to live in Amsterdam, and they're like they ski for nine days every year. They take a trip to Austria with their whole family. A lot of Dutch people do that, and they're like, how come we've never done this? And same with all my friends from the East Coast. They come out and they're like. This is so fun. Like you could just, you should mix this up. Instead of going skiing four days in a row, go skiing once or twice. Right. One day you kind of hike up slowly. It's mm -hmm. not that crazy. You just kind of walking up the mountain, talking with your yeah. friends or family, transition to the top, you get one great so hike. ripper. Yeah. So. It's been on my bucket list for a while to actually make it happen. And yeah. unfortunately work gets in the way such that fitting in an hour or two of downhill skiing is pretty much what I'm yeah. for. But no, it's it's awesome. Um, are you working at all with the US ski team or are there any other resources um, here? I'm working with US USA Schemo, okay. which is the the kind of the national governing body of that. Okay. So I'm working with them to kind of help grow awareness for the sport Yeah. Um, and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. I mean, you're definitely in the right place for a sport yeah. of this nature. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so then what does your training program look like? Yeah, so full time. What does that even entail? Uh, I'm just trying to get my volume up. So there was a guy that really inspired me. His name's uh, Nils Vanderpool. Yeah, and he won two gold medals in the last Olympics for speed skating. Long story short, he was a, a really good uh, 
youth speed skater. He was like 14 or something. He won the junior national or world championships. Then as he got older, it kind of faded off and he wasn't really that competitive uh, worldwide. So he took a few years off and then he just starts just doing a lot of zone two training, um, which is low heart rate stuff. So a lot of hikes through the woods, a lot of road cycling, and he just builds up this massive aerobic base. He, right before the Olympics, he's putting in 30 to 35 hours a week. And then he shatters the, the both world records and wins the gold medal. Like, like broke the world record by like 10 seconds or something, like insane on a six minute activity. So I started looking at that and looking into what my training would be like. And it's a lot of zone two training, a lot of base building. So what I've been trying to do with my coach is build up how much I can actually do in a given week. So I started with like five to 10 hours a week, just like low heart rate stuff. Um, I'm pretty much up to like 20 to 22 hours a week now. Okay. Um, I'd like to get it up to like maybe 30 hours a week. Um, the problem is when you get to the, those high volumes, you just gotta watch about the body. Right. The body can break right. a little bit. Right. So even a lot of zone one can be helpful. So, which is like basically a fast walk. Mm -hmm. um, so like yesterday or, or the day before I did like a four and a half hour just like fast walk and I walked like 16 miles Okay. and it was like, yeah, like that. It didn't really wreck my body that, right. that much, right. but I'm building aerobic base. So it's are you big, swimming at all? Um, I'm actually just a really poor swimmer. Okay. Like I did a triathlon and with my Dutch friends when we lived in the Netherlands, we're like, Max, like you're pretty good at uh, cycling. Um, can you swim? We should, we're doing a triathlon. I'm like, oh, I, have, I can swim. Like, yeah, yeah. don't worry about it. Like, I can swim. It's not a problem. Apparently, I didn't like swimming a mile in open water. It's, is, uh, it takes different techniques. It's di well, you actually need to know how to yep. do it correctly. And open water is hard as well. Right, right. So I almost drowned like four times, um, but we finished almost last in the swim. But, Humbling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I've tried. I did like a two hour day where I was swimming. I, did, I swim for like an hour or two here or there. It's fine. I, I do. It's really, really good on like no impact on the body. So right. if the body is wrecked right. or like my knee hurts or my, my Achilles is hurt or, you know, something is wrong, like my foot has a weird thing on it, then the swim is just great. But it's it's definitely a, a, a struggle for me to swim like an hour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not. I swam competitively growing oh, yeah. up, um, and actually last year before some health things, um, I was training for my first Ironman. So mm. swimming is actually my favorite aspect of the three yeah. disciplines. Um, but it definitely, the open water component is a whole another ball game for sure. Um, I'm curious, how has training at this level then adjusted your diet, food, fuel consumption, and planning, and then also just your recovery? What are you doing to keep yourself optimal at such a high level for so long? Yeah, diet um, is interesting because I'm also trying to lose weight, which is, it, it's. I wouldn't say nutrition is easy when you're not losing weight, but it's easier. For example, like my coach sometimes on a, on a four hour bike ride or a four hour run, I'm eating over a thousand calories during the thing. Mm -hmm. And then that really aids in making sure my glycogen stores are up and then I'm like good to go the next day as long as like my feet and muscles are fine. Right. So that's good. But then I don't really lose any weight because right. I'm I'm making sure to pad, to pad the, the calories. And you need it for the performance right. side of it. So it's like, it's always that balance where I'm trying to lose weight. So like right now I think I'm like one, I'm still like 185 and I need to probably get down to 170. So losing another 15 pounds I can lose around half a pound a week and still be fine, mm -hmm. per se. Which is just hard to kind of just nail that, where you want to just under fuel enough, but right. where it doesn't impact performance. Because right. I've been in cases where I'm like, oh, I feel great, I don't need to eat today. And I'll like do a very, very low carb uh, workout. Like I'll do four hours and maybe eat 50 calories or something. And I'll be feel fine. But then the next day, like I'm feeling kind of like down. Recovery. And, yeah. And the thing I always realize when I'm training is the first thing that goes is my mind. And that's how I, that's actually my, my tell, my signal to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm on a long bike ride, I'll start to kind of think uh, like sad thoughts, like 
I don't like this. Like, this is so hard. Like, why am I doing this? Where I know, like, categorically, objectively, I love mountain biking and I love this training in the summer. And there's been times where I'm like, I hate mountain biking. Why am I doing this? This is myself? horrible. But then I'm like, wait a minute. I'll eat one thing. 45 seconds later, it's I'm like, like oh, I'm yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my tell. If I let that go too far, then I start to get the muscular breakdown yep. and I'll start to just not be able to move. But as long as I listen to that, I know I love mountain biking. I right. know I love skiing. Anytime that weird voice pops in, I'm like, uh, something's yeah, wrong uh, with okay. my system here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good reminder. Yeah. Um, and then what does recovery actually look like? Are you doing anything special, working with different practitioners? No, I mean, I have a Theragun um, that, I'll, that I'll use on it, but really, recovery for me is just I'm doing a 5-2 schedule. I'm okay. copying what Nils Vanderpool did. It's basically five days on, two days off. So every week my body gets two days where I do not do a single thing. Yep. Um, I think a lot of people are who, who train at this level are a little more, maybe for lack of a better term, like OCD or you know compulsive about training mm -hmm. that are just, oh, they're just so into it. I'm kind of into it. I just love mountain biking and I love skiing. Yeah. And I love backcountry skiing, like going along a ridge line, going from peak to peak. I'm out there, I'm like, how Beautiful. lucky am I to be doing this? Right. But I'm not like obsessed about, I mean, I actually like love eating. I, I could eat 10,000 calories a day. <laughs> so I, that's why I, I, you know, for the weekends, I'm not really into, I don't have to get my workouts in because I, I don't. Like yeah, my training rest. is five two. Yeah. Do nothing, the muscles come back. And uh, yeah, I think it's mainly about making sure that I'm fueled up because otherwise, that's where the overtraining or the fatigue comes in. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, are you doing anything different from a mental state perspective to keep yourself focused and centered and motivated to keep going after this? Because this is a, I mean, when we talk about long-term goals, sometimes that's a couple months, sometimes that's, you know, a little bit longer, but you're going after something that's significantly further in the future right now. Yeah. Great question. I mean, so something I do whenever I'm about to, whether start start a company, you know, start on a new venture, I, I'm like a super ideas guy. I'm always thinking about all these ideas. But then I'm also super wimpy, risk averse guy that hates all ideas. So I'll come up with all these ideas and then I'll just be like, yeah, it's not gonna work. Or I'll just, you know, just, you know, smash everything. Mm -hmm. So if something has made it out of that phase, yep. I know it's a good idea and I know that I've kicked the tires on it for like three weeks and looked at every possible reason as to why it's whatever. So once I come up with, it's almost like starting a company, like creating foundational you know, vision statements. Like, well, this is my vision, this is my mission, I, I this is why I'm doing it, and these are my values. This, so I'll get that deep with an idea. So it's, because mm -hmm. I hate going into something and then quitting and leaving, because yeah. it's like, well, that was kind of, it was a half-baked idea, right. I shouldn't have gone right. into that. I'm so afraid of, of doing that. Well, creation is really hard. Yeah. So to create something from scratch takes so much effort that if you're gonna exhibit it to begin with, Go all the yeah, way, right. or don't don't start. Yeah. So I, I once it's made it out of there, then it's just a matter of uh, I you know I spent a lot of time in sales. That's how um, that was my main contribution and the reason my main driver of growing the company um, that we sold. So one of the things I always used to say to the sales teams were things are always unclosing. So you close a deal, you think it's going to be oh they're good forever. They're yeah. gonna the next. Five minutes after that phone call, life gets in the way. So the same thing happens to yourself. So I always think about that, that, okay, I'm in. I'm going to go for the Olympics. Let's go. I know tonight it's going to be hard. Tomorrow it's going to be hard. If you're sick, you know, just knowing yourself. So, for example, like if I'm sick um, or didn't get any sleep because the kids were up or something, and I'm, I, I know that I'm going to start to have doubts. You know, it's just human nature that when you are under... High, high stress, you maybe it's like a defense mechanism. You start right. to see why well, everything's gonna not gonna work. Yeah. So I'm just aware of that. Yeah. So like if I'm sick, it's darkness, that old friend. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just be like, okay, and then I cannot imagine even running one mile, much less I'll look and I'll be like, in two days I gotta run twenty miles. I just I I cannot even fathom how that is possible, but then I'm just like you know, don't even worry about it. 
two days from now, Max is going to be totally, totally good at that. Yeah. You need to recover, deal with this. Mm -hmm. And then also just like always re-engaging on the, and reselling yourself. Like, is, is this something I want to be doing? Yeah. Here's why. Blah, blah, blah. Almost like having a, a consultancy meeting with myself. Yeah. It's just like, man, is this something I want to do? Because on the one hand, you want to make sure that you are totally committed to keep going or that you quit something that is not providing you with, with joy, joy or value or, or whatever. Right, right. You know? You I tried think, it and then, okay, we're, you know what? Time to. I think a lot of people kind of like just ride the middle sometimes. And they're like, well, I said I was going to do this thing and now I, I don't really know if I want to do it. And then they just kind of they're not all in. miserably kind of go through it as opposed to like, okay, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Are you in it? Then let's F and go. Or no, let's quit. Yeah. Like, yeah. Bifurcate and be very clear about it. Yeah. So then what do you think from kind of your prior life, your experiences, what are you pulling forward from that into this training? Hmm. I mean, uh, you're looking at it as creating kind of a business venture, a whole effort. Yeah, in a way. I mean, I think, I think I'm just. I, I guess I am approaching it a little bit like a business, where it's always sort of beginning with the end in mind. Um, but then also, I think something that's important with life in general, business or this Olympic thing, is it. It has to. This is so cliche, but it's so true. It's, it has to be about the journey because nothing is worth your life. You know, like, oh, if I can only have a gold medal, it's like, who cares? Because, and you hear about these, these studies of like Olympians in particular, it's, it's, it's a perfect proxy for business or life. It's like, you're working so hard towards this goal. It doesn't matter what happens, you are depressed after. You, you get it. Right. Okay, what's gonna feed that monkey? Right. Nothing, because right. you already got it. Right. Or you don't get it then you're depressed because you didn't, all that was for, for not. Right. So it's all about this journey of like, finding something that you don't hate. And I'm in a very lucky situation where I get to ski and mountain bike every day or five days a week. But it's not at the expense of my primary goal is you know being a good dad and a good husband. And so that is like first and foremost. So I'm always like rechecking my life. I used to do it when I was running the company was always rechecking, like, what are my foundational things? What do I care about? You know, and, and, and checking in with myself and making sure that everything's aligned in my day to day. Because whenever we start to kind of sacrifice ourselves, and it's totally cool to do this on a daily, or like for a day or for a week or something. Right. Oh, I gotta go. Yeah, I gotta step out of my, mm -hmm. my plan, my goal here, and go on a three week road, sh road show and leave my family for a while to do this. like. But then you come back into, into equilibrium. Right. So, yeah, I think just being able to manage a lot of different things is was, was helpful from, from the company. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so tell us about that experience running that venture and then being able to exit. We've got yeah. a lot of people here who are in consulting, who advise large-scale organizations. They work with clients of that caliber. They yeah. might not necessarily be in it themselves, but what what was that like and what would be helpful for them to know as they're consulting or supporting a venture of that capacity? Yeah, um, I'll, well, yeah I'll just give a quick little rundown of the, of the general story. Um, well, long story short, uh, I was working for a company. I'll, I'll go the, the medium, <laughs> medium long. Uh, I was working for a company and uh, wanted to start something on the side and so my wife and I started, every commission check I got, I was in sales. I started paying down all of our student loans, our car loans. I put in a new heating system in our house, tried to really save a lot of money so that we could, we could start this company or I could start something on the side. So I started something on the side. It goes on Shark Tank. It was relatively like, okay. It was bringing in maybe 50K a year, but that allowed me to quit my day job then joined up with a, a friend who had started the software company with his brother. Um, and I came in as like the sales guy to help grow the sales team. Fast forward, we get to 300 employees um, and word gets out that, you know, we're 
the largest company in the world for what we were doing. It was the company was called Fair, Fair Harbor, and it's a software company for whale watches, walking tours, Segway tours, downhill mountain biking, river tubing, you know, boat rentals, you know, any sort of activity. And so we became the largest in the world for that. Um, then sold the company to Booking.com. And so I guess just some takeaways. If I were to be talking to you know someone who's going to talk to me eight years ago. Um, and what I advise a lot of startups and software companies is a lot of times people get caught up in metrics or vanity metrics or, you know, they, they try to find easy street. You know, I've been advising a software company that you're always looking for something. Well, if we could just get this partnership, if we could just, you know, get this, you know, spokesperson, there really isn't any easy street that I've seen. And it, it happens every once in a while where someone gets lucky and then, yeah, they, uh, you know, they get bought by, you know, for $200 million or a billion dollars on, on a product or something. But 99 times out of 100, the, what I find that makes companies really successful is just having an ability to brute force revenue, which is usually in the form of sales. Um, sometimes it can be marketing, but it has to be a revenue focused company. Yeah. When you have companies that are very product focused and if you build it, they will come sort of situation, it's just so much harder. Like you need to literally capture lightning in a bottle for that to happen, as opposed to if you have a company that, you know, has a strong sales arm, mm -hmm. or if you can help them develop that sales arm, where look, there's a lot of green field, there's a lot of market, whether it's enterprise, SMB, it doesn't matter. If they have a mechanism to repeatedly bring in customers, then you have a machine that you can optimize. Right. If there's no sales... There's no way to be selling to. It, it's just so to be hard. For. Yeah. They have to have a sales function. It doesn't even need to be that good. Just people Fun. working through the funnel that then you can tweak and look, where, where, where does this need to be improved? Right. Um, yeah, the other thing I'd say is just, I think the reason we were so successful is none of the other softwares were willing to do the hard work. I mean, I guess it's the same thing I just said, but we did phone sales. Okay. And we would lob out 10,000 phone calls into the market every week. Wow. And our competitors were doing like, just like a drip email campaign or, oh, we found something on the, an AI on LinkedIn that will automatically send people LinkedIn messages. Just like no, so sense. wimpy. Yeah. <laughs> we just called everybody and then we're just like, say, hey, what's up? How's it going? Oh, you, okay, we'll chat later. And we just tried to do a lot of volume. Yeah. And the next thing we know, like one of our competitors goes out of business, we get like 35 inbound calls Whoa. in five minutes. Whoa. Because they all knew us. Okay. And we weren't always trying to, you know, I don't know, it's just more about can, can everyone in the market know who we are? Because yeah. sometimes they're not ready to, to switch softwares or something. And I think sales is, a, is a, in a large part is a, is a numbers game as opposed to the traditional sales bro or sales pro will be like, oh, I can close anybody. Yeah, well, we found that a lot of good reps were actually not the best closers. They were just the best at consistent volume. Yeah. They knew how to make 100 phone calls a day and not alienate their lead base. Just, huh. So if they're doing 100 calls a day, 500 calls a week, I mean. That's gonna start turning over. Yeah, and then you know, let's, let's say times four, you know, we're looking at like, 2,000 phone calls, they're talking 2,000 clients, prospective clients a month. At least 10% of those are maybe considering a change. Right. So you got 200 like semi warm things, as opposed to the person who's trying to be the absolute perfect salesperson. Yeah, I think that's where, where a lot of companies fall down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So my background is in a lot of sales, but of professional services, not necessarily of software, um, background in software. But uh, I come at it from a very different angle because my skill set is not in the high rep type mm -hmm. of sales. It's in the relationship-based sales where it's yeah. the long sale, it's the nine-month sale, it's the really getting to know the organization and their needs. But those sales were only possible because we had the high rep volume sales team members who were going and pursuing the leads to begin mm -hmm. with to generate them into the sale of that long lasting relationship that then could bloom from there. Yeah. It's it's so interesting how the tactics differ depending upon 
what you're trying to capture and be able to to convert. Yeah. But I liked your point earlier where you said it's it's not just about closing them once. You're having to continue to close day in and day out and keeping that happiness always ongoing. Yeah. No, hundred percent. I mean, there's so many so many examples of you know it's just always thinking about who the other person is on the other end of the phone or the other end of the zoom call it's like look they're busy they're running a business how do you think how, how hard do you think that is to do whatever they're doing let's say you're talking with the chief marketing officer of xyz company they're worried about their kids their family traffic you know getting their next month's bonus they don't care about you you know like and so you always need to be thinking about that. And I think a lot of people come at it from a perspective of like, this is what I have, this is my product, and this is why you should do it. It's so coming from your own perspective. And Versus that can what? sometimes, yeah, yeah you'd be barking up the wrong tree. Totally. Um, okay, so then I'm curious, any thoughts or advice for consultants who might be interested in doing similarly to you where you started something on the side first before you kind of went full into something else um you know the world is changing and people are certainly getting interested in some other side hustles any other thoughts on how consultants even when they're super busy can find time for those passions yeah i I love this question basically something that's always stuck with me i heard it somewhere 20 years ago but if someone said something like okay so yeah you're gonna be working a 40-hour job cool um if you're gonna be an entrepreneur you need to be able to put in at least some 80-hour weeks okay um in your life so that means you got 40 hours a week of full-time stuff so what are you doing you know on the with with the rest of your time you know there's we all probably watch maybe a little bit of tv here or there maybe you read maybe you you know do X, Y, and Z. There's there's usually time in the day to to do something else on the side, um, and I think that a lot of times people look at entrepreneurship in the sense that okay, I got to save up some sort of nest egg and then jump out of this airplane like with no parachute and just try to figure it out before I go splat. Whereas I think that there's ways to do it where you just say, look, like sometimes fear gets in the way, but if you can put fear to the side. If you're a consultant and you're working, you know, you're working like 50 hours a week or something, you just say, look, what could, how could I do this on my own? Is there one client that absolutely loves me and doesn't actually love my, my firm or something, you know, it, it, could I get that client just myself? Interesting. What does that look like? Because I think there's a lot of unintentional gatekeeping for starting a company. It's simply just because people don't know how it's done. Once you've done it, it seems so easy. So maybe finding like a mentor or someone who's started their own company or hung their own shingle and you just say, look, uh, any, any advice? Because when you find out, it's like, Oh, I just got to go on like legal zoom and it takes like 10 seconds. And then I just open a a business bank account and then I make a website on Squarespace. And within eight hours I have an entire company and it's, and then all I need to do is convince my three top, uh, you know, clients that, you know, this is what we're going to do. And then I just come up with my rates. And then next thing I know, like I got this going. I mean, sometimes there is a little bit of difficulty with, you know, conflict of interest. So maybe sometimes there is an actual jump that needs to be made. But uh, I think a lot of times it's just really thinking, is this something I really want to do? And just making the plans to do it. Yeah. 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 And going for it. And you're exactly right. I mean, I remember when I started my consulting practice, seven years ago now, actually this month, which is pretty mm-hmm. exciting. Um, I, like I hadn't started a business before, but you just kind of take one step and you take another step and you take another step and the road becomes clearer the further into it you go and you, you, you have to trust yourself. You're a smart person. I can figure this out. Yeah. And if, and if I can't, I'll find the right people who can help. Right. That's really the big mentality is being able to, to draw also on your own awareness and others. Yeah. And then also just making sure that you're self-aware that if it is something you can do. Yeah. I've also met, you know, soon to be entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that maybe don't have the chops to do it because it's, it's not, sometimes it's not about skills or this, it's about the getting your face smashed in so many times. Like, and I think a lot of times it seems so easy. Oh, if, if only this or if only that, like it'd be so easy. If, if, if this sounds interesting, like 
okay, imagine, you know, whatever your fancy stuff is that you do, Starbucks or you buy organic blueberries or whatever, like, okay, what if you didn't do any of that? Oh, you buy like $25 bottles of wine? What if you bought $3 bottles of wine for two years? Could you do all these things? Could you make all these sacrifices? Do you want to be in a movie where there's like a montage of you grinding it out for a couple of years and your life sucks, but you're doing it your way and it's so hard and you're crying on the floor in your closet a couple of times, uh, but then at the end of it, you maybe get back to the salary you currently have, but you're your own boss. If that sounds like alluring and exciting, then it's like, you are ready for entrepreneurship. If that's like, uh, that sounds awful, then maybe sometimes it is better to stay as an employee and, and do stuff on other stuff, yeah. other ways to, to generate like enjoyment or, yep. or happiness. You yep. know, like Absolutely. entrepreneurship, you really need to want that, that hustle. And then also self-awareness that do you actually see a pathway to, to getting clients? Yeah. Cause it's not just, you got to be able to prospect, get the clients. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship is you got to have all the different assets. Prospecting, finding out who the potential clients might be, convincing them, sales or marketing, getting them to actually become your new client. Then the operations are ongoing work. If you're already a consultant today, you probably already are pretty solid at that. Then there's also some some operational stuff, you know, like billing and you know, run, you know, doing your business taxes and stuff like that. With that said, it's not rocket science. It's just, do you effort. want to, yeah, effort. Do you want to do all those, wear all those hats? If that sounds exciting and there's, let's say, a 75% chance of failure and you like those odds, then what are you waiting for? <laughs> like, let's go. Yep. It, it definitely takes uh, a certain personality type. But um, what I love about what you're doing with the Olympic training is, you're taking your skill sets and you're completely pivoting it in a different way. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for all of us to look at what brings us joy and where can we pursue other talents and interests that it might not be something full time. It might not be something that ever makes us money, but it does bring joy and it does extrapolate upon maybe past gifts or skills that we never actually got a chance to, to go for and to develop. Uh, many of you know, I started singing in 2020 as a means of finding joy during the pandemic. And that just has brought so much joy to my life that I didn't even know that I was missing out on. It brought back my voice in a way that I didn't know I'd given up. And so I do think that there's just, there's, there's so much opportunity in the world right now to just kind of dig in and explore what's possible, that is my tagline, but like, what else can we be doing? What else is there out there that lights us up? Because while work can be a means to an end, mm -hmm. it also, there are ways that we can look at it from different perspectives that can bring joy. But then, you know, sometimes it is just that means to an end and there's other ways to get around that with right. our other pursuits. Yeah, I mean, something that I've done since I've been an adult forever, is I do this thing where I write down in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years and beyond, you know, who I wanna be when I grow up. Yeah. Um, and then just something I've added recently is you cross out all the things you're doing for other people. You know, I know some people who are making $500,000 a year, totally miserable. And it's like, man, like how'd that happen? <laughs> like, you know, it, and, and I think figuring out what you want in life. I mean, I, I kind of adapted it from the book, Four Hour Work Week from Tim Ferriss when he does the dreamlining exercise. But for example, before we did the company, um, we were ready, I was ready to retire in the sense that I was done working for you know a company. I, was, I would never work for someone else again. I was only making like 40K a year. But I realized, what do I need in life? This was before we had kids. I want to wake up and read the newspaper. I've never read the paper before, but my dad did. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna wake up, read the paper. I'm gonna eat sunny side up eggs. I'm gonna go out on a two hour mountain bike ride through like amazing single track. Then I'm gonna go to a farmer's market with my wife. We're gonna get all kinds of good food. We're gonna get a bottle of wine. We're gonna cook a nice dinner, split a bottle of wine, eat a nice dinner, and then eventually have kids someday. I was like, that that's great. amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not that expensive. Yeah. I don't need anything more than that. So then I started refocusing the life of like, huh, I don't need this, like any of this. I can drive a Honda Civic forever and it's gonna last forever. I don't need to have a car payment. I don't need to have this. I don't need to have that. 
And then I was like, wait a minute, my dream life is right there. And it, so I think sometimes we're trying to keep up with our, you know, our keep up with the Joneses, keep up with, you know, your, the people in your high school class or your college class. And you're thinking about all these other things. And it's like, really, what do you want? Yeah. What, what do you need mm -hmm. to, to be happy? And then it's like, man, like, would you rather go to night school, get an MBA, make, let's say you're making, I don't know, make it up $80,000 a year right now, crush yourself for two years, maybe end up having to work 75 hours a week, maybe you get paid 150 k a year, getting paid double, working 50% more, or at your 80 k a year, you can probably get your work done in like 20 hours a week, and they'll probably let you work from home because you're just in a, in a or whatever, and you kind of really enjoy your day to day, you know, you start factoring for that. And it's like, man, you know, are you saving money? Where's that money going? Yeah. And so many people are like, uh, if only I could go mountain biking like you. It's like, well, well you could. You can. Yeah, it's, it's, it would take some changes. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Well, and consulting is a really interesting uh, demographic because it's well paid, well compensated, but very nominal time, free, because lot of travel and a lot of client demand so it's it's an arduous work week typically um, and then but there is high disposable income and so there's very much a sentiment of kind of keeping up with the people you're working with and keeping up as you're being promoted through the ranks and kind of what's a bit mm -hmm. expected as you're going from associate to consultant to manager director partner etc and so being able to kind of put your own blinders on and think for yourself versus what's expected of you as you are a consultant right. is freeing. Yeah, 100%. And then, so there's one, the financial thing, and, but then there's also, you know, I've been thinking about the, the athlete sort of thing. I did a post yesterday about it, is there's this all this new data about not only zone two, but zone one, like really slow stuff. Like, and I was saying, like a fast walk. So a lot, I've, I've worked with a lot of people and friends and people who are DMing me or commenting like, how can I get my volume up? Especially, you know, uh, someone who works in an office, you know, presumably a consultant, there's a lot of, you know, nitty gritty work you gotta do, but then there's probably also company-wide Zoom meetings, there's phone calls that you just need to kind of sit in to like understand context, right. where you're not actually, you know, crunching numbers, making spreadsheets in that exact moment. Can you go for a walk during that? Oh, yes. And so adding like, oh, I'm gonna put my zoom on, I'm gonna hide my camera, like, and then you just go for a walk. You're still working, you're listening. Mm -hmm. And if they need to talk to you, you're not out of breath because you're not on a run, right. you're just walking. Right. But then if you get your walk, you had an hour a day. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, you added five hours of zone one training. Oh yeah. And then yeah, let's say you're training for an Ironman or a marathon or Tough Mudder, and you gotta do your normal stuff, which is like, let's say, you know, running whatever, or biking however much per week. But if you can supplement with walking, it will add aerobic base to you. Totally. So then it's like, okay, there's... Mm -hmm. And it also makes, I found, those type of meetings a lot more enjoyable and pleasant. And I'm somebody, I am not good when I have to be tethered to my computer on a screen. I'm so yeah. two-dimensional and flat, and it really kind of messes with my ability to, to read the room, uh, whereas in person is a lot more effective. Whereas if I can just put everything else off and have my headphones in and be on a walk and be out in nature, I can think so much better. I listen so much more effectively and I can be poised to respond because I don't have all the other external stimuli that's actually impacting my ability to, to rationally think. Right. It's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. No, and it's good for sure. them. Yeah, 100%. And I, I highly doubt that even if you have to be in the office, that any employer would literally you know, say no to this if you're just like, you know... You know, for my mental health, I really would enjoy taking this call uh, on the phone yep. and walking. Like, even if like you were gonna do it in the office, every once in a while, even if you, you're with a client, could you go for a walk? Possibly, yep. I mean, it depends. But I mean, this is the type of stuff where I think that you can start to, if you realize, you know what? I'm gonna work at this company for the next 10 years. I'm not super stoked on certain aspects. Adding things like this could, could help out. They do, they certainly yeah. do, absolutely. Well, Max, any other advice or recommendations that you have for this audience? It's been so much fun chatting with you today. Yeah. Um, no, no more advice or recommendations. Just, you know, I, th I think something I just say to everybody is something I said a little bit earlier is just 
think something that really helps a, a lot of people is really just thinking about what you want to be doing. Um, I think that so many times we just get into just doing what you're going from point A to point B, your life kind of turns into a bit of a treadmill and you're just doing what you're supposed to be doing yeah. and you're doing great at it. You know, you're successful, you're climbing, yeah. Yeah. but then are you really happy? So that's the type of thing I, I always think about. And I think that more people could do that is just thinking about not compulsively, but just where you want to be. Yeah. Um, Design your ideal day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Well, in my ideal day, this meets the high on the list yeah. to be able to be doing this with you. So thank you very much. Really great to have you here. Uh, thank you all for tuning in to the Consultants Council, this podcast, uh, and have a great day.